If you have your Bibles and can turn with me to John chapter number 10, John chapter number 10, we've been in a series entitled Journey with Jesus and just going really verse by verse, passage by passage, story by story through the book of John. The book of John is the book that was really written to the entire world to show who Jesus was. And just because we live in a world that has all of these facts and all of this information at our fingertips, it does not necessarily mean that we know who Christ Jesus is. And so the book of John is really the revelation and the the exposure, the identity of who Jesus is. And so with that in mind, we'll look at John chapter number 10 is where our uh, passage leads us today. If you would please stand with me for the scripture reading today. We'll begin in verse number 22. We went down through verse number 21 last Sunday evening, talking about how that Jesus is our shepherd. We'll pick up in verse number 22 as the story continues, and it says this, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. Some of you, it feels like you're in a parenting moment right now, right? I already told you. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, Ye are God's? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works." that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. We see their response in verse number 39. Therefore, they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. Would you go back and would you look at verse number 24 of John chapter number 10, and we'll read that out loud together. Verse 24 of John 10, ready, begin. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. For the next couple of minutes and from this passage, I would like to preach a message to you as we continue in this series, just simply entitled, The Identity of Jesus. The Identity of Jesus. As has already been sung, one of these days we will see him as they saw him, but we don't have to wait to know Jesus until that moment. As was just sung prior to the message, he's a wonderful, merciful Savior. And let me just encourage you with this this morning, child of God, or maybe you're slipped in among us and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, Jesus wants you to know who he is. And so this morning, I would like for us to look at the identity of Jesus from John chapter number 10. Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're so grateful that you are a God who does not hide yourself from us. Lord, you desire for us to see you for who you are. 
And Lord, as we see you for who you are, may we in turn respond with the response of following you in faith. Lord, I ask that you would give me the words to say, empty me of myself, fill me with your spirit, and hide me behind your cross and your word so that those who listen may see you and not see me. I ask that you would give me the words to say, Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we look at this passage today. May we take it and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Some of you will have to go back in your mind a little bit, and you might not recognize the name right off the top of your head, but there was a man who became pretty infamous and associated with a company by the name of Todd Davis. Todd Davis was the CEO of LifeLock, and in 2017, they began running ads that look a little bit like this. And so you might remember this from your web browser popping up, that LifeLock would protect your identity. He was so confident in his product, and I've actually blacked it out, I don't feel like that the church needs to be a part of identity stealing, Um, but it's blacked out. But actually the ad had his social security number, said, my name is Todd Davis. This is my social security number. He was so confident in his product, believing that his identity would never be stolen, that he published his social security number all over the world wide web. How many of you think that's probably one of the poorer choices you could make in life? What became very apparent shortly after many of these ads began to show up that by 2018, Wired Magazine uh, commented and wrote an article that Davis's identity had been stolen 13 times and they followed with this statement that we know of. 13 times Davis was contacted by creditors and saying that he owed for a loan, the loans amounting in almost $7,000 by the time you added them all in, different states, different countries even, different people using his social security number to obtain things that were not his. And, And so how many of you would say his product probably was not the most successful? to the point that the Federal Trade Commission eventually fined LifeLock $12 million for deceptive advertising, knowing that their $10 monthly service was not doing what it was told that it actually would do. And while the world wants to know who you are to get something out of you, Jesus desires that you know who he is so that you can get something out of him. The world wants to know your social security number, your credit card number, your bank account, your routing number. The world wants to know you and and what makes you tick and what makes you work and, and how to get something out of you. But Jesus stands before these Jewish people and they said, if you are Jesus Christ, who you say you are, then tell us. And as Jesus begins to describe his identity, he does not describe his identity so that he can get more out of them. He describes his identity so that they can get the gift out of him. And this morning, I believe that what Jesus would have us to look at from this passage is not something that shows us more of who we are, but something that shows us more of who he is. You see, ultimately, we call this book the Word of God, and while we seek to apply it to our hearts and to our lives, this book is not about Joel Norris in 2024. This book is about our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. And so we arrive at this passage, and we are not here to learn more about who we are. We are here to learn more about who He is. And by learning that and applying it to our hearts and to our lives, I believe that what we will uncover is this, is that we serve a wonderful, merciful Savior who we can trust with every aspect of our lives. And so I want to give you quickly four characteristics from this passage that show us what Jesus wants to know about him. The first one, I believe, that is very simple but shown in the passage is that Jesus wants you to know him. Jesus wants you to know to know him. In verse number 26, after the question is posed in verse 24, it says, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. He responds in verse number 26, he says, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We live in a world where we often try to hide who we are, where we often try to mask 
maybe our problems. We try to hide our issues. We veil our insecurities. Because the truth is, is if anyone really knew who we were, we would probably sit there and doubt, what are they thinking about me? My wife and I, sometimes when we travel, we, uh, we, we're in church every single time that we go on vacation. My wife is going to be coming out with a book entitled Church Adventures on Vacation because we get put in some pretty difficult situations and uh, some, some awkward ones. And if you're, you're in ministry, you know, every now and then you don't want to be the people who sit around on vacation and shut the lights off. It's just kind of the way that you're made. And um, I was raised to be in church on vacation, but because of that, we get put in some weird spots. And so being a good Baptist pastor and ministry leader, I don't go into a church and tell them what I do. I try to hide who I am. I try to hide what I do. Several years ago, we were on a 10-year anniversary trip, and it was just my wife and I, and there really weren't that many churches in the area we were in, and so we drove about 25 minutes to slip into a church, and it was pouring down rain. We sat in the car. There was no one in the parking lot. We were really doubting our faith decision at that point. Do we want to do this? Do we want to place ourselves in this position? And so we walk in the doors, and we walk in the doors, and they said, oh, you guys are guests, and yep, just what we wanted, all the fanfare, all the attention. So we walked in, and they said, well, you're in for a great treat. We actually are not meeting in the auditorium. We're meeting in elective groups, and so you can pick your elective group. The way that I pick my elective group is which one can I blend in the most with and get out the quickest from. So I looked in a couple doors, and we ended up in one, and long story short, that was question and answer, and I was not showing off at all, and I didn't, I didn't raise my hand and answer any of the questions. We just sat in our little seats and listened to the discussion. And afterwards, the teacher came up, and he said, hey, it was good to have you. It was great, great to see you. And where are you from? We're from Tennessee. We're at in Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. What city just outside of Nashville? Do you know Smyrna? It's not that. Well, what do you do? I work for a nonprofit. What's your name? Joel. What's your last name? Is this, what kind of interview is this? Where are we headed with this? So we got in the car, and long story short, we ended up going out to eat with the teacher on our last evening of our 10-year anniversary trip. We got in the car, and Lauren said, I, I understand why you try to hide who you are and, and try to blend in with everybody else and not tell people, but at some point, people start to think you're some sort of weird double agent <laughs> and hiding what you, who you are. I'm glad you finally just fessed up and said, I'm Joel Norris from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I work for Franklin Road Baptist Church. And that's why we ended up out to eat at a fish and chips place. (laughs) And we laugh about it, but I've had my shoulder cried on. I've had job offers at other churches. I've put my wife in ladies' prayer groups on vacation. We voted on fruit baskets here a couple years ago at a church that we visited. But it's because we try to hide who we are, and here's what I want you to understand, is that Jesus wants you to know everything about who he is. These people, they stand before him and they ask him, if you are who you say you are, then just tell us. And Jesus looks at them and he says, the reason why you don't know me is because you're not one of my sheep, but I can promise you this, my sheep know me and they follow me. Jesus wants you to see him for who he is so that when you see him for who he is, you can place your faith and trust and following in him because he's a good God, he's a faithful savior, he's merciful, he's wonderful, and he says, this is who I am, now you can trust me. Jesus wants you to know him, but secondly, Jesus also wants you to know his salvation. Jesus wants you to know his salvation. He says in verse number 28, he says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You see, you can know Jesus and not know the salvation that he brings. 
You can know who he is and still split hell wide open. You can know who he is and miss out on the gifts that he brings and the salvation that you can experience through him. And this morning, as Jesus, just like he did 2,000 years ago, stood before these Jewish people, and he says, not only do I want you to know me, yes, you can see me, yes, you can ask me questions, but more than anything, I want you to experience my eternal life and the salvation that I can give you. And today, there are two types of people who sit in this room. There are the type of, there's the type of person who knows that their salvation is secure and they know that they have eternal life. And if I were you and if I were in your seat and you are classified in one of those people, it is a great time to rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. But the second group of people are if you're here and you are a faithful member of the South, you can know who Jesus is, but you must come to a point to where you know his salvation as well. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't talk about your head knowledge of Jesus Christ. It doesn't talk about the, what you, the facts that you know. It doesn't talk about what Bible verses you learned at vacation Bible school years ago. There must be a point in every person's life where if they are going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, they make a decision where what is in their head goes to their heart. There will be so many people who are in a burning hot hell one of these days, and I don't share this as good news, we don't rejoice in this, but they will miss, hell, miss heaven by 18 inches because it's the distance from their brain to their heart, and they'll say, well, I knew everything that there was to know, but just knowing Jesus doesn't mean that you know his salvation. And let me just encourage you with this, that if you know Jesus, knowing his salvation takes you to a whole nother level, because when Jesus has paid for your soul, when he has blo- bought you with his blood, when you experience his salvation, all of a sudden the things and trials of this life don't shake you the way that everyone else does. Because while your reality may be uncertain, while you may have doubts, your eternity is settled because of your salvation. And if you're a child of God and you know that salvation, that is something for you to rejoice in because Jesus wants you to not only know him, he wants you to know of his salvation. Thirdly, Jesus wants you to know his security. Jesus wants you to know his security. At the end of verse number 28, he says this, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. How many of you understand that an insecure salvation is not salvation at all? But a secure salvation is truly salvation. So much of our world today promises some sort of security only for us to find out that it is not what it actually is. Just the other day, my wife and I were talking about something that we thought was healthy. Come to find out they're getting sued because they weren't healthy. Imagine that. And then her comment was, at least Mountain Dew is who they say they are. (laughs) They're not claiming to be healthy because they're not, so we'll just keep drinking it, right? But so much of our world claims that, well, this is what this is going to provide. You take this pill, it's going to change this. You, you do this diet, it's going to do this. And there's so much insecurity about the things of this life. But the salvation of Jesus Christ is not just a blessed salvation, it is a secure salvation. Jesus gives us this illustration, and, and I, I go through this with every person that I get the opportunity to lead to the Lord, is I take them to this passage, and you go to verse number 28, and he talks about how that we are placed in his hand. 
But then in verse number 29, he says, My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And so you almost get this, this grasp of something to where we are in the hand and the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and, and we also have the Heavenly Father, and those two mighty hands together are what holds our salvation. And if you're here today and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's not something for you to be insecure in. It's something for you to be secure in your salvation because it's not in your hands, it's in the hands of the Father. If your salvation was based upon you, it is very insecure. But if your salvation is based off of the mighty hand of your heavenly Father, then it is in good hands. And so Jesus wants us to know his security, but then fourthly, Jesus wants you to know his Father. Jesus wants you to know his father. Several years ago, there was a study that was done on the millennial generation and the influx of references in scripture and in songs and in preaching about Jesus Christ. What had begun to happen and what had begun to transition in the church, capital C, was that churches stopped saying so much about God and more about Jesus. And so they had referenced pastors and ministry leaders and younger generation asking them why they thought that that was so. And one of the findings was simply this. I don't know that this is untheological. I just think it's very interesting. Is that the younger generation believes that because Jesus walked this earth and we have stories of him, that he is able to understand more. They see him as being a representation of God in this world. The Bible teaches us that Jesus faced temptation, he faced trials, he faced difficulties, just like you and I do today. And so because of that, churches and preaching and and some of what we do, we highlight Jesus because he has been in our shoes But Jesus did not come just so that you would know him. He also came so that you would know the Father. And while they are equal, they operate very differently. And there is no greater proof of that than Hebrews chapter number 4 that teaches us that we have a high priest, which is Jesus Christ. And because of that high priest, we have access to the Father. Which means this. The Bible that sits in your lap that gives us stories of an Old Testament God, our Jesus gives us access to that Old Testament God. Our New Testament Savior gives us access to the work and power of that Old Testament God who walked with Israel, who showed them every step of the way. And Jesus did not come just so that you would know Him. He came so that you could come boldly before the throne of grace through His blood. I have a key to my house. I was just at my parents' house yesterday. I have a key on my key ring to my parents' house. Why? because I know my Father. And here's what I want you to understand. While they would maybe not welcome this, anyone who knows me has access to the home and resources of my Father. Why? Because I have access to it. There would be a lot of you that you would not walk up to your pastor and my dad and say, hey preacher, could I borrow your weed eater this weekend? But you might come up to me, and if you know me pretty well, or I've got some, some guys in our young adults class that, hey, I, I, my weed eater's down. Do you think you got one that I could borrow? Yeah, I got a key. Let me go get it. Let me give it to you, okay? You don't come with me because they wouldn't want you to see the garage, right? <laughs> but they have access to his resources because they know me. And please listen to this. If you are a child of God and you know Jesus as your Savior, you have access to his Father who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus does not just want you to know him. He desires that you know the Father. And lastly, I want to give you one more that I believe shows up in this passage and will be applicable to each and every one of us. Is that Jesus 
wants you to know his works. Jesus wants you to know his works. I want you to look at verse number 25. Right on the tail end of them asking this question, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Look at verse number 32. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? Look at verse number 37. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. I don't believe that Jesus would be the Savior that we think that he is if he did no work. I want you to think about the Gospels that lay in the front of your New Testament, four of them. The truth is that God could have sent his son, Jesus, and he could have said, Jesus, I need a sacrifice for sin. I need someone who is perfect and blameless and holy. I need a lamb. And Jesus could have come to this earth, could have been born just as miraculously as everything else, and he could have died on a cross and done no miracles and no works. And his salvation and his sacrifice would have been just as relevant. You do realize that God could have done that. God could have sent his son, said, just die on the cross, raise from the grave, get back to heaven, we'll figure the rest out. But we have four Gospels that talk about a Jesus who walked with the people, that talked about a Jesus who healed the blind. We have a Jesus who, in the chapter that we'll study this evening, who raised the dead. We have a Jesus who, according to John eleven thirty five, 35, wept at the graveside of a friend. We have a Jesus who, according to Matthew chapter number 4, faced temptation at the very hand of the devil. We have a Jesus who prayed and fasted. We, have a, we had a Jesus who had a little bit of trouble, for lack of a better term, with his employees. We have a Jesus who faced things very similar to us, and he wants you not just to know him, but he wants you to see his work. And the Gospels come to this pinnacle when they get to the work that is done on the cross of Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, while the world wants to know you because of what they want to get out of you, Jesus wants you to know him so that you can receive the blessing and get something out of him. I don't know about you, but there are times to where I grow weary of being culture's puppet. Commercials are driven so that, well, if, this is, if you have knee pain, this brace is for you. If you have this illness, this prescription is for you. If you have this, then you need to do bank with us. If you would like to have this return, then you need to invest in this. And there's just so many people. What can we get out of you? What can we get you to buy? What can we get you to consume? What can we get you to watch? And what Jesus says as he dies on that cross and as he gives us his work and his blood is that I'm not up here so that I can get something out of you. I am standing in before you so that you can get everything out of me. And I don't know about about you, but as society wants more and more out of me, I long for a Savior who wants nothing out of me, and I get everything out of Him. 
He is a good God. He is a great Savior. And He does not stand before you and desire for you to know Him so that He can get something out of you. He desires for you to know His works and who He is and His identity so that you receive the blessing. And that is a Savior that is worthy of our following. That is a Savior who is worthy of our focus and our attention in this life. And as Jesus answers these Jewish people, he says, I don't want you just to know me. I don't want you to even just know my salvation, the security, and my Father. But he goes so far to say this, I want you to know my works. I want you to know what I would do for you. And I don't know the position that anyone is here I don't know where you find yourself. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what questions you have. I don't know where you're at in your season of life, but here's what I do know, is that you have a Savior who wants to work in that moment. You have a God who wants you to know who He is through His Son, Jesus Christ. You have a Savior who wants to take your needs to the throne of His Father and say, God, this is one of our children. Look at the need that they're facing. He wants you to know of the security that you have in Him. While everything else is insecure, Jesus and His salvation is perfectly secure. But He wants you as his child, to know his works and experience them for yourself. There's three responses at the close of this chapter. The Bible tells us in verse number 39 that some of them sought to catch Jesus and he escaped from them. He goes away in verse number 40, it says, and many resorted unto him. So they get near, I need to learn a little bit more, but verse number 42 says, and many believed on him there. Can I just encourage you that while this world seeks to know who you are to get more, I firmly believe that it is time for us as Christians to start learning more about who he is. I firmly believe that it's time that we stop becoming consumed with our identity and become consumed with his identity. That we stop worrying about what we look like in the image of the public eye and start worrying about what Jesus looks like in my life. And here's my prayer for our church and our church family and for you in your family, is that as you learn more of who Jesus is in your heart and in your life, that you won't just know his salvation, that you won't just know his security, but you will know his works. I think there's some people in Scripture and in the Gospels that they came back and they knew nothing else about Jesus other than the fact that he healed their loved one. They knew nothing else about who Jesus was, but their belief skyrocketed in him because they said, this is what he did for me. And here's where we have arrived at as Christians in 2024, is that we know more about what a doctor or a financial advisor can do for our lives than what Jesus can do for our lives. We rejoice more in our 401ks than we do the blessings and providence of our Heavenly Father. We rejoice more in what the world has given us than what Jesus Christ has given us in Him. And it's time for us as Christians and children of God to say, I don't just want to know Him. I want to know what He does and I want to experience it for myself. I want to be able to sit down with my family and with my children at the dinner table and say, let me tell you what God did for us today. 
I want to be able to sit down with other church members and, and co-workers and say, let me tell you about what Jesus did for me this week. We talk too much about our work and not enough about the glorious work of Jesus Christ that he desires for each and every one of us to know.